There are 24 pictures, and we're making each of those pictures one at a time. Time, time, time. In Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, the pleasures of labor and the pleasures of recreation are continuous. Work and play are not held in contrast, but shown to be in a symbiotic relationship. Vertov illustrates a modern life composed of simple pleasures, intimate milestones, and those incessant operations that keep the everyday machinery of sunrise and sunset rolling. A glorious resolution of the forces of industrial revolution, diurnal revolution, and social revolution. For any symphony, there must be conductors. Vertov's conductors are filmmakers. The cameraman of the title looms over the city, his own body a machine, his eye the iris of the camera, the cranking rotations of his arm akin to the gears that drive the city. An editor selects scenes from everyday life, and her decisions shape those scenes. Her operations are paralleled as well, with a pedicure and a sewing machine mirroring her process, her selections and cuts. Vertov was not imagining these filmmakers as wizards or cinema as magic, but his illusions do suggest a romantic correspondence between the movie and the city that seemed to transcend the mere act of representation. The subject, as if enchanted, runs for the benefit and at the command of the cameraman. In another world across decades, an ocean, a cold war, and irreconcilable politics, these themes of labor and illusion would persist. This willed enchantment between the apparatus and the subject becomes a matter of personal conviction in the work of American animator Mike Jitlov, a talented outsider to the Hollywood Dream Factory. He tells his story in a rebellious, metafable autobiographical feature film, The Wizard of Speed and Time, in which Jitlov dramatizes the experiences of an independent filmmaker who enters into a one-sided, devilish contract with a broadcaster. You're an actor. Uh, yeah, when I have to be, I do, I do a lot of things. Yeah, well, casting's downstairs on the 12th floor. I want to talk to the guy who did your effects. Fine, here I am, and I brought a whole reel of effects. Don't bring a whole reel of effects in here just because you want a job as an actor. Unlike Ziga Vertov, Mike Jitlov is an individualist whose desire to cast illusions is tied to his devotion to entertainment. But like Vertov and the subjects of Man with a Movie Camera, he regards labor and recreation as continuous, the work of the artist, and the pleasures and pastimes of the artist inextricably bound together. Like Vertov, Mike Jitlov sees the world as open to wonder. His illusionism can set it in motion. Enter the Wizard of Speed and Time. This is a job for... Green Power. How about a production shot? Yeah! And now, for Hollywood. I am the wizard. I... Got it. We're off! The Wizard of Speed and Time is a heroic character dreamt up to serve as the animator's double, a wide-eyed spirit of innocent wonder and an expression of creative consciousness, safe from the cruel intrusions of the real world. 
In the real world, the creative spirit is under attack. Toiling under the rule of unimaginative people, the dreamer struggles and is made to feel like a failure. The dreamer's ideal forum is cinema, for cinema is a thing of pleasure and fun. It transcends pure recreation. It becomes a free space for stray thoughts to become fables. But cinema is also where the enemies of promise act at their worst. Through a harsh irony, the dream factory of Hollywood is still a factory, a territory of warlords and serfs. Look, get out of my car! Yes, I have to join a dozen unions to do this. Well, then you would better join them. We are Union Guild signatory, and I don't handle anybody unless they are professionally gilded. I think you mean gilded. Mike Jitlov conceived of the Wizard of Speed and Time out of obvious frustration with the powers that be in Hollywood. The film is a celebration of specialized skills and knowledge that Jitlov had a hard-won mastery of. In his first appearance, the wizard served as an avatar for Jitlov to demonstrate these abilities, in a short film that could also serve as a professional reel. At rapid speed, the wizard collapses great distances as he races in time-lapse through postcard visions of the Earth. In his travels, he's hailed as a hero, and accompanying him on his journey is a theme song in which he declares his intention. Jitlov's pixelated vision of movie magic was following in the footsteps of Norman McLaren, who had used the technique of pixelation, stop-motion photography applied to human subjects, to more overtly political ends, as in Neighbors and A Cherry Tale, both allegorical fantasies of the futility of conflict. In McLaren's films, the strange physicality created by pixelation is a sign that we are dealing in metaphor and illustration. This is not real life. In Jitlov's film, Wizardry and in turn, Pixelation, is not a tidy metaphor, for it is also an illustration of the magical potential of the camera itself. Jitlov in costume becomes the iconic Wizard of Speed and Time, but it was Jitlov out of costume who was the true magician. The theme song is, deliberately, about both animator and subject. Jitlov would use the making of his short as the premise for his feature-length autobiographical film. By that time, he had a fully formed sense of the disparity of intention between the executive class and filmmakers in Hollywood. Despite his recognition of the arrogance and greed of the forces he was up against, Jitlov embodies naivety, justice, and a folksy earnestness that signals the nobility of hard work and creativity. Like a stock Capra hero, he's an idealist. These qualities set him at odds with a world that doesn't care. The resulting film deals with the corruption of creativity by malicious, uncreative forces. Jitlov's critical sensibility doesn't only target arrogant, brooding executives. He also goes after unionists with their closed ranks, nepotists, litterbugs, the IRS, the whole of the modern world with its sense of professionalism, its prejudicial expectations of formality, its illogical bureaucracies. Against this, he celebrates the dreamers, men in celluloid helmets who want to share their visions. All the big things I should have done by now if I wasn't so busy doing little things. 
I wonder how many other people are out there writing stories and scripts that nobody else may ever read, making movies that nobody may ever see, discovering secrets, important things that could help everybody. Maybe I shouldn't make films for a living. I've got a bicycle. I could deliver Steve's pizzas. Oh, if only I could do that for real. If we could live on hopes and wishes, make movies with the speed of thought, all the films that could have been, and all the dreams that I could spin. In his search for work, Jitlov ventures out into a Hollywood that doesn't understand him. In this, he's not perfect. He admits to certain idiosyncrasies. For example, he refuses to shake hands. The reason for this is later revealed. He's telepathic, and as he puts it, movies are the safest way that he can touch people. Like UHF and Pee-wee's Big Adventure, the film is campy and whimsical, the fantasy of an outsider. Like UHF's George Newman, Mike Jitlov is a dreamer who the world regards as a failure. His quest will bring him into conflict with a mix of villains and enforcers who will either be charmed by his naivety or who will antagonize him. But like Pee Wee Herman's journey, this experience will also end in friendship, love and victory. The acceptance and homecoming of the exceptional outsider. The antagonistic executive, Harvey Bookman, asks, is this guy a filmmaker or an actor? We might ask the same question, but the answer is as plain as the one he gives. I am when I have to be. The film uses a simple hero's journey structure as a platform for Jitlov's mock sermonizing for the Church of Cinematology and his philosophy of independent creativity, a lived philosophy that would mark him as a lone revolutionary, if not for the social spirit in which he's seen operating. His filmmaking is not about personal vision, but social vision. It's born from collaboration. He pursues it alongside family and friends, and he pursues it against the oppressive and anti-creative force of business. Thus, the film becomes the triumph of the creative outsider and, conversely, of the social spirit of cinema. That social spirit is worth lingering on. Jitlov's mother and brother appear as themselves. In the credits, Jitlov is played by the Wizard of Speed and Time, and the wizard plays himself a beautiful declaration that the creator has vanished into his creation. And Richard Kay as the antagonistic Harvey Bookman, plays a grotesque caricature that bears his own real-life role, having produced the original short film. This is a film of personal vision, but in the world of cinema, personal vision takes a village. The hustling world of Hollywood is recreated with warts showing. An undercurrent of comically perverse sequences offer a chortling glimpse at the underbelly of the business, from childish wordplay about getting the clap. This morning in the car, I gave you the clap? Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. To an SM fantasy, to an implied criticism of the casting couch culture of the villains of Hollywood. Jitlov's work walks a line between childlike wonder and a mature rebuke of the absurd hypocrisies of family entertainment. Throughout the film, confronted with Jitlov's magical illusionism, Cynical audiences ask, what do you think these guys were on? It's the square world's response to creativity and imagination, but it's also the morally bankrupt response of a misanthropic culture confronted with magic. 
rather than have their awe-inspired, they sneer and they punch holes in the motives of the illusionist. What is a wizard? In the context of Jitlov's film, a wizard is an independent force, a conductor not just of cinema, but of dreams. As protagonist, Mike Jitlov is interested in helping people find their dreams. Hustling his own talents, this seems to be aimed at both a potential audience that would be wowed by his illusions, and the executives who need artists like him to realize their product. Jitlov will find audiences, but the executives aren't interested. They use his naivety as the basis for a bet as to whether he will be able to make, with no resources, the short film he wants to make, which is, of course, The Wizard of Speed and Time. With a premise inherited from screwball comedies, Jitlov becomes the naive stooge to people with power and security. Jitlov and friends reenact the creation of The Wizard of Speed and Time, fighting against bureaucracy, deprived of a budget, pursued by Keystone Cops. Their work will be stolen, their contribution will be concealed, but in the end, the truth will come out. The film's preoccupation with the process of filmmaking is filtered through whimsy, magic, and play. When at last his short film is shown, the viewer knows how the shots were achieved, but those shots remain magical, speaking to the nature of film magic, which can convince us of illusions even when the process is revealed to us. The Wizard of Speed and Time becomes an act of revisiting and restaging and mythologizing Jitlov's own past. I began to make films around 2008. I'm fortunate enough to live in Toronto, Ontario, where an organization called the Liaison of Independent Filmmakers of Toronto, or LIFT, is a long-standing and accessible supporter of independent film. Lyft is a rental house and post-production facility, but it's more than that. It's a community hub governed by a spirit of free collaboration, and it's an incubator where new artists can explore and develop their practices and gain greater understanding of themselves in the process. That's what it's been to me. I was led there by a lifelong interest in movies. The Wizard of Speed and Time came out when I was four years old, I don't know precisely how or why my brother and I watched it as frequently as we did. It was just something encountered in a video store by parents who knew that their children were curious about movies. But it felt as time went on that we were the only people who had seen it. I would later learn of its cult following, but that cult following never translated into anything resembling general recognition. The only other person I know whose experience of Jitlov's film is similar to mine is Carl Rainsalu, who's been the technical coordinator of Lyft for all the years that I've been going there, and who, like me, worked in video rental stores and did his time on film sets, and who's been a silent collaborator on every film that I've ever made, doing more than just facilitating spaces and cameras and supplies, but helping me and teaching me about technology. Carl Rainsalu has taught me more about 16mm filmmaking than I ever learned in film school. As an autodidact of the first order, he has surely taught himself more about 16mm filmmaking than he himself ever learned in film school. In his own films, there's a restless, probing curiosity about what the frame, pulsing vagaries of light and pixelation can create. Like Mike Jitlov, Carl possesses a unique and imaginative brilliance for the creative use of technology. Like Jitlov, both Carl and I operate at the edges of an industry that has a tendency to regard people as disposable, that sorts its workers into two piles, stars and everyone else, categories that aren't easily reconciled with the love and passion that drives people to make movies. When presented with the question of what is wizardry, 
I can only think of the impossibility of magic, and the certainty of the magic of labor, the potential for hard-earned knowledge to take root in the soul and manifest, through expression, things that could not otherwise be. I think of Karl Rainsalu and his creativity that brings forth vibrating forms, abstract colorful geometries, and a harmonious relation between man and mechanism, the creative will, and the animation of everyday life. The question of magic in cinema is inextricable from questions of labor. The most awe-inspiring illusions take patience. They are translations of time, from hours and days of planning and executing into mere seconds on screen. This is at its clearest in stop motion and pixelation, and the ability through these techniques to create another world where time operates at the whim of work and not the other way around fashioning worlds of wonder and freedom, like those forged through the films of Mike Jitlov, or for that matter, those dreamt out by the rest of us. Cinema is one of those rare forums in which invisible labor can be translated into something so much more meaningful than mere function, and the spell it casts is far richer than the suspension of disbelief. It enchants us, and it commands us to dance.